Father in heaven, thank you so much for gathering us together this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the blessed Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of your angels and your Holy Spirit. And we pray that they would be present this morning to minister to us, to convict our hearts of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. And that also, Lord, you will direct our thoughts heavenward. May you please guide us. May you please lead us with your spirit, we pray now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with the Bible text this morning found in 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 14. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died, and Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Elisha is about to pass away. His ministry is about to come to an end. And the king of Israel, Joash, comes to seek advice and counsel and possibly a blessing from him. And this is what takes place in 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 15 to 17. Elisha says to him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elijah put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou have consumed them. Elisha, he's trying to encourage the king before he passes away. He's trying to tell him that God is still going to be with him, even though Elisha's presence will not be there anymore. God will still fight the battles for them, and that they would have victory over the Syrians. And so he tells the king to shoot the arrow and he says, this is how God is going to deliver you. But then he continues on in verse 18. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them and he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. How many times did he smite the ground with the arrows? Three times. That's what thrice is. And he stayed and he stopped. And what happened? Oh, he obeyed the command of Elisha. But what happened? In verse 19, And the man of God was wroth with him, and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria, till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria, but thrice. Elisha is actually angry with him. He's wroth with him. Righteous indignation. And he says, why did you only smite the ground three times? You should have done it five or six times. You should have done it much more than that. You should have persevered. You should have pushed through. you got to understand this. You know, I've always wondered why Elisha seemed to be so hard on King Joash here. But he's like, smite the ground. And he takes the arrows and he goes, that's it. You know, three strikes on the ground does not take much. He's already shown that the arrow is the, the object lesson, the promise that God is going to deliver the Israelites from the Syrians. But all he does is he takes those arrows and he hits it three times. What should you have done if the, the, the prophet said to you, I want you to smite the ground? I'll tell you what I would have done. And then I would have looked at Elisha. You know what I mean? I would have looked at him and said, when shall I stop? Right? But he didn't. He just did it three times. And then he stopped. And Elisha was annoyed with him. He was angry at him. You should have done it much more times than that. He should have persevered. He should have pushed through. He should have had more zeal or energy in what Elisha was asking him to do. Friends, God is looking for men and women today who will push, who will attempt much, who will go beyond a simple command and do much, much more, not because it was simply commanded of them, but because of the zeal that they have for God. Look at what it says here in Ministry of Healing, 497, paragraph 1. Christian life is more than many take it to be. 
It does not consist wholly in gentleness, patience, meekness, and kindliness. Do you see that? The Christian life is much more than many of us imagine it to be. It's not just about being a nice person. It doesn't talk about just being just gentle and patient and meek and kind. Friends, what is this referring to? This is the fruits of the Spirit that we find in Galatians 5, and 23. It's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, right? Uh, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there's no law. What we're told here in the pen of inspiration is the Christian life is much more than that. Look, I'm not saying that we should just um, for forget these Christian graces that are important, but she's saying it doesn't consist wholly in just this. Let's continue that quote. Ministry of Healing 497, paragraph 1. These graces are essential. What is essential? They are necessary. You cannot do without them. They are very, very important. But there is need also of courage, force, energy, and perseverance. What else is needed? Not just these fruits of the Spirit, but we need courage and force and energy and perseverance. You know, when we think of the Christian, we think of meek Moses. We think of gentle Jesus. We think of all these fruits of the Spirit. And whilst they are important and essential, we must build upon that and go beyond just the fruit of the Spirit. We need courage. We need force. We need energy. We need perseverance. And then it says this, the path that Christ marks out is a narrow, self-denying path. To enter that path and press on through difficulties and discouragements requires men who are more than weaklings. And this is where I got this, my sermon title for today. God, He wants men and women who are more than weaklings. Do you see that? What makes us weaken, weakling? We can have these graces of, of gentleness and patience and meekness and kindliness. And I'm sure that there are many nice, kind and gentle people out there today. But God, He's asking for more today. He's asking for courage. He's asking for force and energy and perseverance. We got to go beyond just the fruits of the Spirit. They are essential. They are the bedrock upon which we build everything else. You don't want a person who's courageous and angry. You don't want a person who's full of force but impatient. You see that? That's like King Saul. So we need these two things. They must blend together. The fruits of the Spirit is our foundation. But we got to go beyond that today. And that's what Philippians also talks about in chapter 3 and verses 13 to 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Do you see that word press? The word press there in verse 14, it means to run swiftly or to run after a person. That word press is also used in the English. If you look at the Greek word and you search it throughout the New Testament, you will also find the word press means to persecute, to suffer, to press forward, even though there is persecution. We see this sentiment and this same word of press in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. The same Greek word is translated persecuted. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The zeal that the people need today is the zeal that will be able to endure persecution, to have the courage of the martyrs, to be able to push forward with energy and forth, uh, force and perseverance. This is the sort of of men and women that God is looking for today more than weaklings. Paul, he was such a man. 
You see, in his previous life, he was a persecutor of God's people. He went about looking for people that, that were following Jesus to kill them and to put them into prison. And he had his great zeal that was misguided until God shone light into his heart on his way to Damascus. And with the same zeal, when God converted him, that same zeal that he put into the energy to kill God's people, now he put it into God's work. And he was able to do much for God. And he endured much for God as well. You see, many people who come out of the world, the reason why they become such great workers for God is because of that energy, that zeal, that, that, that fervent um, prayers that they would push, push up to God and, and the perseverance that they would be able to endure all these trials and persecution. Why? Because in the world, people know how to work hard for their money. They, they know how to chase for money and, and put 20 hours into a day just to get their desired goal. People know how to study hard and long for good grades and to get a good scholarship. They stress out and they push for wanting to be successful, even building a business enterprise. And God, He wants those same virtues applied also to the gospel work. What was it? Courage, force, energy, and perseverance. But let's keep reading. Ministry of Healing 497, paragraph 2, the next paragraph. Men of stamina are wanted. Men who will not wait to have their way smoothed and every obstacle removed. Men who will inspire with fresh zeal the flagging efforts of dispirited workers. Men whose hearts are warm with Christian love and whose hands are strong to do their master's work. Do you see that, friends? Men of stamina are needed. Men that are able to run a race with energy, not just a short burst, and then they go, go, go out like a, a shooting star, but they're able to run a marathon, run that race with patience that is set before them. But they need stamina, not just the fruits of the Spirit. They need courage. They need zeal. They need energy. They need stamina. There'll be obstacles along the way, and they got to overcome it. But friends, in order to have this stamina, you need to train. You need to train. And what is the training ground? It's our life. It's the trials that come our way. You know, some of us, we, we think, oh, you've never been through my experience. You don't know this and you don't know that. And it looks like you've had a good life, Pastor. How can you ever, ever understand what I'm going through? But Jesus understands. And He tells you, there has no temptation taken to you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. And He will not suffer you to go. He will not allow you to, to go beyond what you're able to handle, of course, with His strength. But with every suffering that comes our way, God gives us training. And He says, now you overcome this. You're ready for the next trial and the next trial and the next trial. We need love, yes, but we need stamina as well. But we also need the hands that are strong to do the Master's work. Let's keep going on. Paragraph 3. Some who engage in missionary service are weak, nerveless, spiritless, easily discouraged. They lack push. They have not those positive traits of character that give power to do something, the spirit and energy that kindle enthusiasm. Those who would win success must be courageous and hopeful. You see that? Many who are in the missionary service doing on serving God, it says they lack push. What is push? The power to move yourself to do something. What do we call that today, friends? Another word for push, it's called motivation. Motivation. The spirit and energy that kindle enthusiasm. It's more than just the fruits of the Spirit that are needed in these times to finish the gospel work, to preach the gospel to the whole world. Why? Because in 2 Timothy 3, 1, we're told, know this also, that in the last days, 
perilous times shall come. We are living in those times already, friends. And if we are to get through it and finish the work in these perilous times, men and women of courage, of energy, energy, of push, of zeal, of perseverance, fully motivated, are needed to finish the gospel work. If you call yourself a Christian, friends, we're living in a day and age where people will attack you. They, they, they will call you names. They'll ridicule you. And maybe even, and certainly in the future, they'll persecute you for righteousness' sake. And you can't get too easily discouraged, friends. We can't just give up just like that. We got to go beyond the experiences that we are daily facing because we know that with Christ, we can do everything. We can suffer all for His name's sake, if He is with us. Let's continue. Paragraph 3 of Ministry of Healing. Look at this. They should cultivate not only the passive, but the active virtues. While they are to give the soft answer that turneth away wrath, they must possess the courage of what? A hero to resist evil with the charity that endures all things. They need the force of character that will make their influence a positive power. Friends, we must cultivate these passive virtues, but also these active virtues as well. You know what cultivate is? It sounds like growing crops. It must be cultivated. It must be attended to. We must push ourselves. We've got to train. We've got to develop it. It doesn't come just like that. Too many of us, we are weak. We are nice. We are gentle. We are loving. But we are weak Christians. Christ, He's calling us to stand up and be counted today in the gospel work. We must have the courage of a hero to resist evil. And then it continues. Some have no firmness of character. Their plans and purposes have no definite form and consistency. They are, but, they are of but little practical use in the world. Do you see that? This weakness, indecision, and inefficiency should and must be overcome. There is in true Christian character an indomitableness that cannot be molded or subdued by adverse or difficult circumstances. That's like persecution and trials. We must have moral backbone, an integrity that cannot be flattered, bribed, or terrified. You know, when I read this quote, it reminds me of Daniel in the lion's den. It also reminds me of Daniel standing in the king's court, being made the prime minister of the most powerful nation in the world at that time, and then being conquered by Medo-Persia, and also being made the prime minister as well. Daniel, he was a good and rich man. He lived a comfortable lifestyle, but he didn't allow any of that to make his faithfulness to God any less dim. When the law from the Medo-Persians came in, he still, with firmness of character and courage and enthusiasm, still prayed to God three times a day. We need men like Daniel today. Not only should we be studying his prophecies, we should be modeling his life as well. A man of courage, even in the face of a lion's den. Friends, no circumstance changed his outlook and his faithfulness to God. He was faithful even to death. We must have plans and purposes that have a definite form. And when we have this, then we have a goal to aim for. We have a purpose of which we are living today as Christians. What is your goal, friends? Apart from just, okay, I've got to make sure I read the Bible every day. A noble aim, yes. Instead of just saying, oh, i got to pray today. What is your goal apart from that? Have you told God, this year, I want to give a Bible study. And when you, when you pray that sort of prayer, with what sort of energy and perseverance do you move forward when you go to church, when you go to care group, when you meet people on the street? God, is this the person that you want me to study with? It gives you a definite aim. And just as you have an aim in your career, I want to retire by the age of 40. I want to earn 10 million. I want to open my own business. I want this and I want that. We have aims in our lives. 
What's your aim spiritually? We must have a definite aim. But then it continues. Ministry of Healing, 498, paragraph 3. Many who are qualified to do excellent work accomplish little. Why? Because they attempt little. Thousands pass through life as if they had no great object for which to live, no high standard to reach. You see, we have to have an aim, friends. One reason for this is a low estimate which they place upon themselves. Christ paid an infinite price for us, and according to the price paid, He desires us to value ourselves. The reason why we accomplish so little is because we attempt little. We have no aim. We have no goal. But then at the end, it also says what? We place a low estimate upon ourselves. We sell ourselves short. We tell ourselves, I can't do this. I can't do that. We say things like, I tried and it doesn't work. There were no results. People weren't interested. We, we get discouraged. We get easily discouraged. And in God's work, we say things like, oh, I tried preaching and it was a disaster. I, I, I've done it for a really long time and I haven't done it, pardon me, for a really long time and I can't remember how to do it. And so when we see the need, we tell ourselves that someone else has to rise up and, and fill that need. It's not me, God, not me. Send someone else and we tell the Lord to pick somebody else apart from ourselves. And we place upon our own selves a low estimate. And we just simply say, I can't do it. Or, I have no time. You know, I want to share some experiences about what I've gone through and, uh, you know, the things that I've had to do to push. Um, when it came to preaching, you know, I remember when I was studying in, in, in theology school and I tell this story every year to, to the SALT students. Um, but, you know, I still remember we had to take this class called Speech and Homiletics, learning how to preach. You know, how to say and how to speak and, you know, your, your hands and how to use them and different things. And at the end of the class, we were graded on two sermons. We had to preach seven-minute sermons. So you know where we got our curriculum from for the seven-minute sermons. But, um, you know, in my seven-minute sermon, I made an appeal. And in the appeal, I, 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 I made the appeal and everybody stood up. The whole school stood up. And then we had closing prayer and we sat down. Anyways, in the afternoon, the teacher, he would review our sermons. And he called me in the afternoon and uh, he, he went through and he was showing me, oh, good, good, good here, good, good there. And, uh, and then he came to the appeal and he said, Ben, do you know why everyone stood up? It's because they felt sorry for you. Oh, man, my world was shattered. They stood up because they felt sorry for me. And ever since then, every time I know appeal is coming, I begin to sweat because I don't want people to feel sorry for me. I get nervous and, you know, but I, uh, I got all this negative feedback in a sense and it was enough to discourage a person to say, hey, Ben, preaching is not your gift. But you know what? I continue to get opportunities to preach at churches and uh, I, I would preach and you know what? People give you feedback straight away or my classmate would stand at the back correcting what I said wrong. I was preaching at a nursing home, an evangelistic series and and the classmate who was my senior was sitting there and correcting, correcting, correcting. I said, yes, thank you, sister. Making mistakes all the time. Or I've preached at places, people where they fly you over and invite you to preach. And you know what? At the end of the sermon, people would stay back and tell you all the things you said wrong. They didn't like the spirit it was set in. They didn't like how you said it and all sorts of things. And you would think, hey, God, this is just discouraging. You are not calling me to preaching. And that's why I've always loved teaching more. Why? You can get feedback straight away. You can adjust it. It's easier. And, you know, all these criticisms, it's just so easy to just go, oh God, this is not my calling. You're calling someone else. You're calling somebody who has more talent, who understands more, who whatever it is. But God, this is not my cup of tea. And it's just downright humiliating standing on the stage sometimes. But you know, I could have said, God, anybody but me. But you know what? God kept putting me in these positions to preach, to stress me out, to get me comfortable standing on the stage, to make me study harder for the content. You know, so 
had I just said, God, send somebody else. Or God, it's just, I don't want to be a pastor. They preach too much, right? I would have given up too easily. I want to give you another instance, you know. If we want to do much for God, we got to attempt much. You know, for, for piano, I only studied until grade 5 piano. I hated practicing piano. Do you know why? Every time I wanted to go play, my mom said, Ben, practice the piano. Saturday nights in Penang, growing up there, they all, we always played volleyball, table tennis. We played all these running games and, and I wanted to go. And mom says, not until you practice your piano. I hated it. And it got to the point when we moved to Australia, my mom said, ah, oh, now it's more expensive, right? You hate practicing, I hate paying. No more. I quit piano. But you know what happened? This guy came to our church, he was from Indonesia, and um, he, he started playing, and man, he played by ear, and he made the, the music sound so beautiful. And I just remember, in our youth group, I would sit there on the piano chair next to him, watching him play, and I was just mesmer mesmerized by his playing. And then the church got me to play piano, just for Sabbath school, not for divine service, because I wasn't that good. But I tell you, I, I said yes, and I always remember there were so many mistakes. We would, we would sing two to three hymns before Sabbath school begins. And I was so nervous that sometimes I would stop in the middle of my piano playing because I was confused. And they just kept singing. The congregation would just keep singing. But I persevered. I would come back on Friday afternoons and I would bang away on the piano until I got a headache. But God gave me more and more opportunities. There was one time I went to do Bible work in Hawaii. I was working for an amazing, fa amazing facts evangelist. I was there for 10 weeks doing Bible work and then the evangelism was for about four weeks. And guess what? They had no pianist. So the evangelist asked me to do piano, uh, to play on the piano. I had to play for the singing. I had to play for the special music. I had to play for the appeal music. You know what happened? I ended up practicing three hours a day because it was so stressful and the, the the special music guy whenever he sang he was choosing all these difficult pieces horrible i came away from that tapping my fingers to this day you know when i hold my wife's hand i'm tapping tunes in my head because of the time that i practiced so much in hawaii and i could have gone to the evangelist and said look i did not sign up for this i came here to do bible work i did not come here to play the piano and I could have made excuses. But look, friends, sometimes we have expectations, and then sometimes God says, this is the real reason why I brought you here. Not to be a Bible worker, but to help with evangelism, piano. And as a result, today I'm able to record for the scripture songs. Not that it's the best sounding, but God has given me enough knowledge to be able to record the scripture songs because People were coming to ask me, hey, how do you sing this and how do you sing that? I said, look, I'll record it for you, but I'll get someone else to sing. That's the reason why we're recording all these scripture songs today. And we, and Sabrina and Nosla, they're, they're creating more scripture songs to be a blessing. But uh, I'm sorry, the piano is a bit behind in recording that. But you see, friends, if we learn to attempt much, we can accomplish much. We can do much more. You know, when it came to this COVID and um, all the sermons are online, I still remember my first sermon was over the iPhone and at the end of it, all the youth, at least on the sex side, they were telling me, oh, how, how to improve and what to do and everything. I moved out and even my wife told me uh, how to improve as well. I moved out to the living room and uh, I still remember putting the chair there uh, with a, a piece of paper telling us when we're going to start. But I praise God for the opportunity to preach. And I praise the Lord to be able to do all this video stuff and, and get tips from Donnie and different people and lighting and all those, those sorts of things. If we uh, attempt much, at the beginning, it will be humiliating. Why? I'm not an expert in videography. I never have been. You'll see some of the videos I've edited before. I look red. I don't know how to color grade. I had to ask Donnie to help me adjust the camera and I don't touch it anymore. This is how it looks and that's it. I don't use this this camera for, for, sh for shooting photos or anything. It's just set that way because I don't know much. But friends, if you attempt much, you can accomplish much. It goes beyond love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, patience, 
gentleness, long suffering. Friends, we need courage. We need push. We need stamina. We need zeal. We need endurance. We need all these things. Perseverance. If we want to get the gospel work finished in our lifetime. Ministry of Healing 498, paragraph 5. None should consent to be mere machines run by another man's mind. God has given us ability to think and to act, and it is by acting with carefulness, looking to Him for wisdom, that you'll become capable of bearing burdens. Stand in your God-given personality. Be no other person's shadow. Expect that the Lord will work in and by and through you. Friends, I'm not asking everyone today to be a preacher, but I know that everyone, God is calling into His vineyard. And there are specific burdens that He places upon everybody, especially for His work. And if you want to discover what that is, you've got to push. You've got to attempt much. You must have courage to step forward in faith. You must cultivate perseverance and enthusiasm. You must put in much energy. I believe in our churches, there are many more people that God is calling to be preachers. But you're scared. You tell yourself, I'm not preaching in front of a camera before. I'm afraid when I stand up before people. But friends, I know that God is placing this burden of preaching the three angels' messages to much more people than just specialists who have been, quote-unquote, trained in theology schools. And look at this. Christian service 10.4. Look at this, friends. To everyone, work has been allotted. Everybody. And no one can be a substitute for another. Each one has a mission of wonderful importance, which he cannot neglect or ignore, as the fulfillment of it involves the weal of some soul and the neglect of it the woe of one for whom Christ has died. Everybody has work allotted to them by God. What is your aim as a Christian? Has God given you a definite aim for which you should live that life in faithful service to Him? Do you know what He's called you to? Have you attempted much? Or has every, at every turn when the pastor comes or the elder comes, you say, not now, I'm not ready. I'm not called to this. I'm too scared. Give me another year. Give me another two years. Friends, we got to stop throwing out excuses. we got to be courageous to attempt much for God. I'm not qualified. You know, even with the Sabbath school, uh, I've had a lot on my plate with preaching twice a week. The preparation that it takes to preach online is different than having to stand up before the people. I don't know why, it just, it's not as much preparation for some reason. But, you know, when Singyi, our, our Sabbath school superintendent on Sackside, asked me to teach 2 Corinthians, I said, okay, this time. And as I attempted much, God, He gave me more blessing. Not because I was trained in theology school. I had to go and sit down and write out my commentary from the beginning because I've not been attending much of the Sabbath schools. You see, we got to learn to attempt much. Everybody has a role. So when your Sabbath school teachers ask you to come and teach, when the elders come and ask you to preach, when the nominating committee asks you to take up a position, trust that God has His plan and His reason. Not because there was no one else in the church. Not because you're the only youth there. Not because you're the only pianist and there's no one else. God has His reasons, friends. And some. We need help with Pathfinders. There are some that said, oh, we haven't done Pathfinders in a long time. You know, you've been Master Guides 10 years ago. But we got to attempt much, friends. We don't know how God is going to bless. we got to attempt much. Ministry of Healing 500, paragraph 1. Look at this. Many become inefficient by evading responsibilities for fear of failure. Thus they fail of gaining that education, which results from what? Experience. The way that God educates us is from experience. 
and which reading and studying and all the advantages otherwise gained cannot give them. You know, friends, I don't know why we have this fear of failure. Maybe we don't like to be ridiculed. Maybe we don't like to be made fun of. Maybe we don't like to give, get feedback from, from our sermon. You know, I, I, I don't know what it is, but there, there is this sort of education that can only be gained by experience, which means all the devotions that you have in the world, all the time that you have in prayer, all the time that you have reading the Bible, all the time that you have reading the Spirit of Prophecy is not enough. There is a sort of education that can only be gained by experience. You know, she says that we result, as a result, we fail of gaining that education that results from edu uh, experience. Even a study of the Bible can only take us thus far. You know, in the last verse of the book of Daniel, we're given similar counsel. You know what it says? Daniel 12, 13. It says, But go thy way till the end be, speaking to Daniel, for you shall rest, Daniel, but you will stand in your lot at the end of days. Daniel would stand in his lot, a lot that was appointed by God, a lot that only he could fulfill, a lot that no one else has ever been asked to fill. We all have similar position in Christ's ministry today. And He wants you to stand in your lot. He wants you to attempt much. He wants you to have an aim for which you are living as a Christian. More than just going to church, coming together for, for K-Group on Fridays. And, and, and that's it. He wants you to have an aim for which that you can pray for, you can study for, and you can put and bend all your energies for. Friends, Ellen White was such a person. And if anybody had excuses, it was her. You know, we, we have this testimonies reading for the church, through the world church. If you've never read testimonies for the church, you got to start with volume one. It talks much about her life. But she was hit by a stone at a young age. And she, she was, it was so bad that when the father came back from his work, a few weeks later, he couldn't even recognize his daughter anymore. She was deformed. She was weak. She couldn't even finish high school. She was sick much of the time. But here we are talking about a woman that lived a long time beyond the years that she should have lived, 80 plus years wrote many, many books. And I was just reading this past week, she would speak 24 sermons in a space of six weeks, or maybe it was four weeks. It was about six sermons a week. We're talking about the weakest of the week that God sent in our day and age. She would write pamphlets and articles. She would do so much and be a, a, a blessing to so many people. And then she had four kids to raise as well, and she had to leave them behind many times. And she had motherly instincts. She told the people, it's not because I don't like to be a mother or because I'm heartless or because I'm sick of having children. No, she missed her children dearly. But even then, she attempted much for God and for His work. She gave herself no excuse. You know, friends, we got to have a definite aim. I have an aim of 30 baptisms. You know, many of you know that. I've never accomplished it in one year. But it drives the work that I do. It gives me a vision and a sense of mission. And, you know, I have an aim so that if I can attempt much, I don't know what God will give me. But I pray one day He'll answer that prayer. But this day and age, friends, what is needed to finish the gospel work and preach it to the whole world in our lifetime is not just the fruits of the Spirit. We need men and women who are courageous, who are willing to stand up and be counted because there's coming a time of trouble such as never was ever since there was a nation. And the people that are going to go through it unscathed 
to be able to preach in times of crisis, like Paul when he's in prison and standing before Nero, the judge. We need men and women of courage, endurance, stamina, who will push, who have a definite aim. And friends, even through persecution, they are going to stand up and be counted. Today, the signs are all there. This time of pandemic, we need it even more. Pastors, give yourselves a challenge to preach every week. Every week, lay members, challenge yourselves to study the Bible with somebody. We have a challenge now from the church, the Discipleship Handbook. Find a partner and study it together and grow together. You must have a definite aim. And even though you don't reach it, even though you don't get through it, maybe some of you had a definite aim of 40 days and you tell yourself, I've got to aim for that. And even though you don't finish it, at least you got through some of it, which you would have never had if you didn't even join at all. Are you with me? The blessings that come with having a definite aim is inestimable. You can't estimate it. We need the oil of love, joy, and peace today, friends. But we need courage, energy, push, and perseverance, and enthusiasm to carry the work even further today. And now is the time to take the gospel message, the three angels' messages, even further than we've ever taken it before. Then we can arrive at that point like Paul and say, we have preached the gospel to every creature. And then we can look up to heaven. And when Jesus comes, we can say, I have waited for you. I've worked long and hard for this day. And we will hear the blessed words, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Friends, that is our ultimate aim, to hasten the second coming of Christ. But today we got to take small goals, small steps, the discipleship handbook, studying, having a Bible study with one person, bringing one person to church, the conversion of one person through your life and your witness and your testimony and your prayers and your Bible studies with them. We've got to have some sort of definite aim than just listening to a sermon once a week. Friends, you must be tired of listening to me already, aren't you? You must be. If you've heard me for the last seven years, Maybe you've said, oh, I heard this sermon before. He preached that before. Your, your Christian experience has to got to be fresh. Pastor, stop, stop. Give me some time. I want to share about how God has been good and been working through me. Those are the sort of testimonies we need today. But you've got to start with a definite aim in your Christian life, friends. What will it be? I pray that God would give you that definite aim today that we would realize the purpose for which we were born in this world, here in this location, at this time. We are living in stupendous times and a crisis of inestimable magnitude is about to come upon us. We need now an experience that many of us do not have. Let's stand up and be counted. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I know that you are calling all your sons and daughters today. Everybody that is listening to the sermon and that will listen to it, Father, help them to realize the purpose for which they were born. And I pray, Lord, that you would work mightily and wonderfully through them. I pray, Lord, that you would please stir all our hearts. Help us to have a glimpse of heaven. And then we might say in our hearts, Lord, here I am. Send me. Send me, Lord. Help us, Father, to have a bigger aim in our Christian life than just going to church. Help us, Father, to realize what it is. Give us the courage to pray that prayer. Lord, what is it that you want me to do? And then may you strengthen us. Give us courage. Give us zeal. Give us the energy the perseverance to go beyond what we are so comfortable doing all the time. Lord, please help us. 
Help us, we pray today. May your spirit stir our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.